hello. This is Dr. Jay Smith again, and here we are. Uh, I brought Mel back again. You've all been enjoying what he's been doing. One of the things I love about what Mel and Murad are doing is that they are actually going back and trying to source all the antecedents to Islam, because Islam did not just was not created uh, out of nothing, and it did not come from heaven down to earth. Uh, it was actually created by men, as we're seeing. It was created by men's own uh, ideas, but much of it was borrowed. And in order to create the religion that we have today called Islam, almost all of it had to be borrowed, suggesting that many of those who put Islam together could not think it up themselves. But in borrowing that, they we think could go back and see where they borrow. And you might say that both Mel and Murad, and soon will be, and you see Joe, are sleuths. They are historian sleuths who go back and try to find where this material is. What is it that, such, that points to what now Islam has borrowed? And we're going to do that today as well. Here comes yet another area that Mel has found. Where we think, where we think. He's not going to say categorically, these are what we know as white papers, where we're going to put the idea out there, see what you say, look at your comments, and then uh, try to understand what we now know today as Islam. So, Mel, are you there? I am indeed. Uh, thank you for welcoming me back. Uh, looks like you've got a new it. wall behind you, new hanging. Looks like you're in a new place. <laughs> hey, listen, yeah. your name, Mel. What, 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 what is your name mean? Where does it come from? Because you kind of, yeah. I've been hearing you use that name. What's, what's, what, why, why the word or the name Mel? Well, Mel is uh, an Irish name. Um, it is male, just male or male Isa, which means slave of Jesus. So male oh. or mel means servant or slave. So it's equivalent to Abdul in Arabic. So, so you're, uh, whenever, I wanna, whenever I want to call you as your Arabic equivalent, you're Abdul, slave of, in this case, Abdullah, slave of God. So you're mel, slave of Jesus. God bless you. Yeah. Okay, you've got a whole other area where you say that Islam has borrowed. And we're going to, this. I'm going to let you introduce it. This is about the prayers itself. It's one of the five pillars, is it not? So go ahead, take us through it and show us what you've got. Yeah, so um, well, first of all, I'll just share my screen with you to get started. So I'm going to be focusing on the Misbaha, which is the Islamic prayer rope. And I'm sure most of your audience will be familiar with that. You will have seen it. Um, Muslims often carry it around and they meditate on it during the day. But it's an interesting area to, to figure out where did it all come from. So this is... Is, in a sense, this is the informal form of prayer that Muslims often use outside of the, the main form of prayer that they might do in a mosque. Okay, so just to remind everyone of the categories that I, I use to, to kind of e evaluate the material that I'm using. So a zero would be, have I lost my marbles? It's basically anything like a conspiracy theory with very little evidence or no evidence at all where there's no fact checking. A one would be where I'm fishing with a new idea, pondering, thinking out loud. Uh, number two is where I'm looking at corroborating evidence. A three would be credible hypothesis. And a four is a workable theory. So there's quite a lot of evidence for it. But there's always possibility that there's an alternative explanation when we're at a four, which is what we're going to be looking at today. And a five is... Uh, a conclusive theory which has got a lot of um, supporting evidence from multiple sources. So that's where we're at. Hope that's so today right we're going to be right at number four. So that's pretty high up on the scale uh, to, yeah. of your categories. I would suggest that that, that you have got, therefore, solidification. Uh, you have, you, you're saying this is going to be a workable theory. Let's see if he's right. I'm going to hold you to the test. This is my first time of hearing it, seeing it. So I'm going to be taking notes and I'm going to come back at the end and I'm going to see whether or not you've hit number four or perhaps you're still back at zero, one or two. Okay. So what were we talking about when we say that this is a uh, misbaha? It's uh, the Islamic prayer rope. It's often known as a tasbi. Um, they usually consist of 99 beads to assist in the glorification of God through, following, through the following prayers. Uh, 33 Tasbi, which is the Subhanallah, 33 Tahmid, which is the Alhamdulillah, and then there's 33 Takbir, a very common one, the Allahu Akbar, 
And uh, some suggest the 99 beads also refer to the 99 names of Allah. And some Muslims will, will go through the beads recounting all the different names. If they've got a really good memory, then they can remember all of those 99 names. You know, um, just and, to, uh, jump in here. This, uh, yeah. Growing up in India, this is what we saw all over. Where I grew up in India was where the Islam was at its largest and greatest up the northern part, where we have about 200 million Muslims. I remember it's my whole life watching, and you could see the Muslims, many of them older people, they'd be walking down the road with these beads in their hand of 33, and they would you could see their lips moving, and you know that they're going through the names, the names of God. And whenever you ask them, what are you doing? And they're going through 33 at a time, so times three, that would make 99. So you could see that they were doing this so they could hold and understand uh, that they would get the sequence right. It was, a, it was a help, you might say, for the memorization or help for the sequence so they wouldn't go off on tangents. Good on you. So that is quite well known. That is well known, not just in where in India, where I grew up, but all over the Muslim world. Yeah, it's, it's very central. You know, it's, uh, it's probably the sixth pillar of Islam, in a sense, because it's so important to so many Muslims. So the, as I mentioned, the smaller misbahas consist of 33 beads, um, in which case one cycles through them three times to complete the 99. However, misbahas may also consist of 100 or 200 count beads to assist in the dhikr duties of certain Sufi orders. Okay, so we're going to be exposing another hole in the Islamic tradition, as you can probably <laughs> anticipate. Um, but according to the Islamic tradition, before the misbaha prayer rope was used, people first used loose pebbles or counted on their fingers. According to the seventh, sorry, the 17th century Shia cleric, Alama Muhammad Bakir Majlisi, after the 625 battle, um, 625 CE battle of Uhud, Fatima would visit the martyr's graveyard every two or three days and then made a misbaha of Hamza ibn Abdul uh, Mutalib's grave soil. And after that, according to the tradition, people started making and using misbahas. So this is the tradition. So th just to recount again, so the according to the um, tradition... Just to be fair, Fatima would be the daughter of Muhammad, is what you're referring to. That's the Fatima you're saying? Yeah, yeah, okay. indeed. Now, accord so according to the Islamic tradition, Muslims didn't have a prayer rope to begin with, and it was really Fatima that kind of got the ball rolling when she she started making these sort of pebbles from the grave soil, and then eventually they created a prayer rope. But the idea of a prayer rope didn't pre-exist Islam; it was it was basically their invention. That's the Islamic tradition. You know, this is what they believe. Now it's interesting that this is going to be completely. Uh, disproved today. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is another flagrant hole in the Islamic narrative. The tradition of praying on a prayer rope pre-existed Islam by centuries. It was actually created in, a, in its specific form by a monk who was born in Egypt in 298 AD. And Egypt, of course, is right next door to Arabia. So the location is very close. Now, before we get to that, let's have a look at these... Um, uh, misbahas a bit closer. So notice the importance placed on the number 33 and the three partite structure of the prayer. So we have the Subana Illa, glorified is God, and it literally means God is above, which is said 33 times. Then we have the Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to God, which is uh, again said 33 times. And then there is the Allahu Akbaru, uh, God is greater, which is said 33 times. So you can see you have three sets of 33. So there's something about this number three that seems to be really important to the Muslims. Well, if you think about why 33, it's kind of obvious to Christians. The most important reason for referring to 33 is that it was the age that Jesus died. And three is obviously important to Christians because it's a reference to the Trinity. But why would Muslims be using a prayer rope which seems to be set up for reference to those two key ideas found in Christianity? So if we look at the origin of the prayer rope, the prayer rope was developed in the 4th century by St. Pacomius, one of the desert fathers and founders of monasticism. 
The purpose was to do, as St. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, which is to pray continually. So the monks um, used to concentrate on their prayers by tossing pebbles into a bowl in their cell, repeating prayers over and over, and as a, a, I suppose as a way of motivating themselves by throwing a pebble, it represented each prayer. But this became difficult when traveling around the monastery or even traveling between monasteries. So the prayer rope consisted of simple knots and it was easy to carry around during the day. So this was used instead as a more practical way of counting their prayers. Now the prayer method consisted of the prayer of the heart, more commonly known as the Jesus prayer. And it's a prayer I'm sure most Christians are very familiar with. It's a very old prayer, which is Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The purpose of the prayer was to call on the holy name of Jesus to reflect on one's own sinfulness and the need for Jesus' saving grace and mercy. Monks pray this often, making many prostrations. So as you can see, you can't get a more Christocentric prayer than this one. Notice that it's referring to Jesus as Lord, which for Christians means more than just a very noble human being. It actually is a reference to him being God. Um, there's the use of the name Jesus, which means God saves. Um, there's a reference to Christ, which is the idea of Jesus also being a Messiah. There's a clear reference to him being one of the persons of the Trinity, i.e. Son of God. And then there's the uh, reflection on the idea that we are sinners in need of God's mercy. So it's a powerful Christian prayer. Now, in addition to that, the prayer knot became more complex. So there was a development of this original prayer rope. The complex knot began with another desert father, St. Anthony the Great. So the story goes that demons kept untying the knots, distracting him from his prayers in the cave. He had a vision of the Theotokos, the mother of God, who explained to him how to create knots with, self, with seven interlocking crosses. Just to say in passing, notice that the story is located in a cave. Why, Jay, do you think that might be significant? Well, isn't that what has come out from what we know is the Hitta cave, the Hitta cave story that is now very popular within the traditions has Muhammad in the cave there praying and doing his, am I, am I correct? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have, you know, a holy man set in a cave. This is a really common motif in theories of interest which is egypt syria um iraq all the christian areas uh, would have been very familiar with the story in fact there was a biography written about saint anthony and it was um hugely popular um many christians um read this story and even if they didn't read it they heard of it um and it was a very um popular story and, and lots of young men became monks um, having heard the story of St. Anthony's her heroic battles with the demons. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very fascinating connection. is in the Hitta rendition, which comes after and looks like it's borrowed from this story in the Hitta rendition, it's Jibril who's in the cave in the, in the situation with St. <laughs> Anthony, it's demons who are in the cave. They throw the demons <laughs> out and put instead and replaced them with the angel himself. Yeah, there's even the, 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 even though it's a bit ambiguous, but even in uh, Ibn Isaac's version of this story where uh, Muhammad is attacked, it seems like he's been strangled in the cave. Well, I mean, um, that, that, but that is what they you, say. It's, I mean, and that is what the tradition today says. Now, when you say Ibn Isaac, you mean Ibn Hisham, because we don't have Ibn Isaq. Yeah. So Ibn Hisham yeah. has made it the next rendition, which would be the Abbasid rendition. And that he would say that uh, each time when he says Ikra, and Muhammad respond with ma'akra, I cannot read. I cannot recite. Ikra means to recite or to read. Yeah. He would then was squeezed. But the squeezing was not by demons. The squeezing would have been by Jibril himself. Yeah. Well, at least that's how they've, they've spun the story. But you know what's ah, interesting? So what you're saying is this is the, <laughs> the, the antecedent would have been this, with St. Anthony is that the demons did this. That has now been attributed over to, uh, and in this case, it's uh, Jibril, Gabriel, as we know him. <laughs> Great stuff. Yeah. Well done. I love how you're doing this. And I love the, the how you find that even something as simple as that, as insignificant as that, can be taken and then re retold in a different, um, later, much later rendition. In this case, you, a ninth century. 
telling what's us. really interesting is fascinating you know if for anyone who wants to look at it and i i would encourage anyone to to look up his story it's, it's only about 60 pages sent out the great fascinating story but what's interesting is the demons are terrified of him and saint anthony is so superior to them in terms of his holiness his utter dedication um and he knows exactly what's going on he he's smarter than them. he's he fools them every time and they try and hurt him but it, ultimately he laughs it off and he sees it all as a just an even greater penance that he's doing but if you compare that with muhammad Muhammad does know what's happening. He's afraid. He's terrified. He's terrified. Just the opposite. He is the one that's in terror. In the other case, it's the demons that are in terror. Yeah. So it's it's quite a different. It's quite a difference. So you know, if if I were to choose between two uh, men who you know, uh, and compare them, like if you compare Saint Anthony with Muhammad, Mah Muhammad does not come out well out of the no, comparison. Right. That's a good point. That's absolutely a good point. They should have really made Muhammad. A more like St. Anthony, who had been a much more stronger character. In fact, as we see in the traditions, Muhammad was so scared and so terrified, he runs back home to Khadija and he has to ask his wife, what has happened? What has happened? Can you make sense of it? And she gives this amazing test where she has him sit on one leg and re re repeat the story to her, then has him sit on another of her legs as she's sitting down, has him repeat, and then she takes off all her clothes completely naked yeah. and asks him yet a third time, knowing that if these were angels, if this was an angel that was there, the angel would not stay around if she's naked. So she wanted to make sure that uh, he was not being controlled in any manner by any other outside force. Uh, so showing that he's absolutely terrified and completely opposite of St. Anthony. I, I, you're right. I would rather go with St. Yeah. Anthony than Muhammad on this score. Plus, he, he, he attempted to, according to the, the story, he attempted to commit suicide because he was so terrified. So not a very uh, moral example. Uh, not at all. No. Not at all. Yeah, so the demons could not untie these special knots because they were vanquished by the sign of the cross. So you notice the, the centrality of Jesus and the cross to this prayer rope. Traditionally, the prayer ropes were made also out of sheep's wool because Christ was a sacrificial lamb that gave his life for us. So you can see in every way you couldn't get a more Christian prayer form than, than this. No, actually, this is good because I, I like what you're doing here. You're actually saying... In, in, in when you look at the whole Christian antecedent, they would take every everything about that tradition or everything about that routine is impregnated with theology, impregnated yeah. with ideas. Uh, the idea of 33 years, that's why, because it's the 33rd year that Christ died. The idea of going three times over that you said earlier, why? Because that's the Trinity. The idea of using sheepskin, again, that is referring to the fact that he is the Lamb of God that from the sheepskin. All of this shows yeah. that, that there is theology in everything they do. And that's something that we have seen with the monastic orders and with many of the traditions. Islam probably didn't understand all that, and that's why they've completely confused it. They still like the ideas of 33, and they still like the ideas of three times up to 99, but they don't understand. What, you know, if you're going to borrow something, make sure you borrow the meaning that goes with it, the theology that goes with it. This is something we've seen over and over again. Another case in point is when yeah. Adam and Eve were up in heaven. In chapter 7 of the Quran, take a look at what they're up there doing, telling them not to eat of this fruit. And then suddenly they are, because they ate of the fruit, they're thrown out of heaven. They're not out of heaven, out of a garden of Eden, down to earth in verse 24. And many of the Muslims who come back to me all the time and say, how can, how can you have one person uh, appropriating sin for all of mankind? How can you, this to me, this, uh, they, this doesn't make sense. This is not, this is in, in, not in any form or manner is this justice. And I say, well, then go back to chapter seven, verse 24. You've taken a story out of Genesis three. You haven't looked at the theology that's in it. You have put it there in chapter seven of your Quran without understanding that if Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, Eden, we're all imputed with their sin because we're on earth. None of us are up in that garden. And Muslims have never thought that through. Be careful about borrowing our stories. Same token, let's go back to the knots. Don't take the story of uh, St. Anthony without realizing that the 33 has significance, the three times 33 have significance, the knots have significance. And be careful, if you're going to use the story, make sure that those are demons, not an angel. Get it right. Yeah. Because if you don't get it right, then you're, bringing, you're, you're, you're loading it with all kinds of not only contradictions, but you're loading it with all kinds of improprieties. And that's why I love our Bible and I love our tradition because they teach us as we're going through them, they teach us not only the story that so we don't ever forget it. 
Yeah, you know, just to emphasize the point of how Christian this prayer rope is, um, the knots are composed of seven crosses. So basically you have seven times 33 crosses in the prayer rope, and this is what <laughs> the Muslims are using, you know? Uh, there's the same religion that's basically denying that Jesus died on the cross is using a prayer rope from a tradition which emphasizes... Wait till Muslims hear this. Wait till Muslims yeah. now. Every I think any Muslim that's listening to what, what Mel is saying, after this, every time you see somebody with those prayer beads going through it, realize <laughs> that those are all crosses. Those are all crosses. You're actually acknowledging the crucifixion. What an irony. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Mel. This is terrific. <laughs> so um, the prayer ropes are often black, representing sorrow for sin. Most prayer ropes consist of 33 knots, representing 33 years years of Christ's life on earth. Normally the prayer ropes would have a cross and a tassel at the end to wipe away the tears of repentance. Now obviously they've removed the cross, at least the visible one from it. Um, but they, sometimes you'll see Muslims with the, uh, the, uh, the misbaha with the tassel still on the end of it. So the original idea behind the tassel is the monks would wipe their face after crying over their, over their sins as they pray this powerful prayer. And actually, just while we're on the subject, I would encourage any Christians out there who would like to take up a Friday challenge is to say this prayer, um, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Say it on a Friday and maybe even say 33 of them just to kind of take back this prayer, which was originally dedicated to Christ. So that's just a suggestion. Maybe someone out there would like to, to take up that prayer again. So Islam appears to have borrowed the prayer rope in imitation of the Christian practice, but it is notable how the prayer was replaced. Instead of the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, they have replaced it, as you can see here, with God or Allah, in the case of Islam. So a prayer that was dedicated to Jesus, Son of God, became prayers to God in Islam. So in a sense, if you think about it, there is a kind of subconscious recognition that Jesus is God in, in using this prayer rope, which is something that maybe a lot of Muslims today don't realize. And so in conclusion, it is not clear how or when exactly Islam came to appropriate the prayer rope. That's something I haven't been able to clarify, but it is obvious that a fictional account was created to explain its origins despite its obvious Christian roots. So that's that's well, it for me. Fascinating. Mel, thanks so much. This is exciting. I, mean, I this is what I love what you're doing because you're actually you're going back and you're just showing the antecedents to all these rituals and these are rituals and you're showing that these rituals had huge significance. The they were created to remind the person who is doing the prayers of the story of Jesus. And in almost every case, this is what we do. And this is why even you're suggesting we do this on a Friday to remind us again uh, of the 33 years of Jesus and also of the fact that the Trin Trinitarian form, but also that these are all crosses and remind us of the cross. Uh, these, this is a good way of, for Christians. We've done this right through the ages. What I love what you have done is how Islam, seeing that, probably growing up with that, and seeing it all around there if they didn't grow up with it, or have taken, appropriated it without understanding the meaning. And this is what we talk about in anthropology. We talk about what we call form and meaning. Are you familiar with those two terms? Not really. You can, you can well, um, ha have a go and I'll see if I follow up with you. You probably do. It's just you remember you haven't yeah. have used the words to do it. What, if you look at yeah. a lot of the scripture, a lot of, the, of what we see in the Bible, Christians have done that from the very beginning. John. John 1.1, 1, 1, Logos. Logos is a word, means the word. It means the word. Ho Logos, the word. And the word Logos was then in, taken from the Greek and incorporated into the idea of the word of God. And so we've taken the word Logos and we've incorporated it into the word of God in John 1.1. 1, 1. You, and the idea of baptism is a, uh, the form itself was well known before Christianity appropriated. It was always done as an initiation into a group. Many times yeah. you could be into a group of men or a group of women or whatever the group is. They would then put them in the water and bring them up again. And they would then, uh, that would be the, the eradication of what has gone before and the new, the new birth of coming up again. So here you have Jesus taking that, that was uh, well known in that age, and then changing the meaning. The form is there of being dipping into the water and coming back out again. The form is there, but the, now the new meaning is you're dead to sin and now alive in Christ. 
And so we have done this as Christians all the way through. In this case, what you're showing is that the form was there. The form was the ropes with the knots in it for the prayers. In this case, praying, remembering Jesus, they remind you to get back to Jesus. And as you pray, and also the, uh, with the uh, Lord have mercy upon me, forgive me that. What's the, what's the statement again that you say was in those words? Um, so it's uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Okay, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, had mercy, mercy upon me, a sinner. That's the statement of faith that is there as you're saying each one of these prayers. And so yeah. that's a, a, state, uh, a statement uh, of, of really asking for forgiveness, which yeah. is what we're asked to do. And in this yeah. case, you do it 33 times. You do it three times, 33 times to get to 99. So that reminds you over and over again that Muslims have taken that. They've appropriated it without thinking through that. When they take the form, be careful because the meaning can easily go along with it. Just like we gave the example of uh, the original sin in Genesis 3 uh, is now incorporated in Surah 7, Ayah 24, without even thinking through the question of how can we be imputed with sin? Well, you're all imputed with sin. Be careful. The meaning goes with it as well. In this case, the meaning has been, they try to destroy the real meaning by simply now, today, in the 20th century, I don't know when it started, but now, much more recently, they've now put the names of God, the names of Allah there in the Quran, the names of God in the Quran. And there are 99 names in the Quran. 33 times 3 is 99. So that's where they have now tried to eradicate the original meaning. And that's true. And that's what we do. We do it as Christians. They do it as Islam. But what I love is that you're now saying that almost everything that Islam has come up with is not new. It's been no. borrowed. And you do borrowing because if you're creating a new religion, which they had to do quickly, once they had the book and the man in the place, they now needed to have some theology that goes with it. Notice all the theology starts to appear in the 10th century after 923. The theology really comes with the tafsir. And the first one to write a tafsir is Al-Tabari. He dies in 923. So you're talking about the 10th century. From 10th century on, then you have people like Zamakshari and Su Suyuti and Baidawi and many others who then unpack what the Quran is saying. And that's where you have the debates that are going on. And the debates are usually with Christians and they're also with Jews. So it's always coming back and forth with those who are around you and mm -hmm. trying to try to accommodate and trying to interpret what you do are now doing vis-a-vis -vis what the others are saying, in this case, the Jews and the Christians. So fascinating that that comes good 300 years after Muhammad died. All of which also supports what you've said earlier. Almost all these debates are happening up in the north. They're happening in places like uh, Baghdad and in Hira. <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> it all seems to, be feed, feed, uh, seems, to, it seems to be feeding to the same era because when these theologies are imported or imposed or introduced into Islam, Islam had moved to Baghdad by that time, hadn't it? Yeah. Kufa Absolutely. was the theological centerpiece. Kufa is where now notice almost all the Qurans come from Kufa. Have you noticed that of the Qira'at? Take a look at the Qira'at. Of the 30 Qira'at, only eight come from Mecca and Medina. The other 22 come mostly from Kufa and Basra and Damascus, but mostly from Kufa and Basra, because that's where all of this is being created. That's where the Quran is being created. That's where these prayers are being introduced. That's where these the, the knots on the beads are being introduced. Incorporated and borrowed, yes, from the Christians, possibly from, uh, and also from this guy, St. Anthony. What's his date again for St. Anthony? Um, he, he's the fourth century. I can't remember the exact uh, year, but he's fourth century, so... So we're yeah. talking about 400 years earlier, taking what he did, even the cave, even the cave you're <laughs> taking pride. I love this, even the cave, uh, the Hira cave, which yeah. is now part of the Siddha, which is part of the biography of Muhammad, written by Ibn Isham. I know it's probably originally by Ibn Ishaq, but remember Ibn Ishaq has been thrown out and replaced by Ibn Isham because Ibn Ishaq did not get the narrative, the narrative, the narrative. You know, if you, if you take the story of St. Augustine, who's from the similar time frame. I think he was from Carthage, if I'm not mistaken. Carthage. Carthage. Yeah. <laughs> Headed that bit Sorry, Car I just want to make sure people, people don't know who you're talking about, but most people know it as Carthage. But go ahead. Carthage, yeah. I um, just said it wrong there. Um, so if you look at the, the biography of, or the autobiography of uh, St. Augustine, the moment he's converted is a moment where a Bible flicks open and he's told, take and read. Does this sound ah. familiar? There you go. There's the Akra. 
take, read yeah. by Jibril yeah. in the Hidda cave. So they borrowed yeah. the Hidda cave from St. Anthony's and they borrowed the reference to take and read from together. St. Augustine, put the two together, conflated the two stories and made it into the Hidda cave yeah. story that we see now in Muhammad's biography that so happens in, order to, in 610. So essentially, in order to make Muhammad sound like a super saint, they've taken the best of what they perceive to be the, well, what they perceive to be the best features of different well-known saints, bung them together, and then they create these mythical stories. And it's, it's <laughs> when you break it down, Saint, you can just see Saint where- Saint Muhammad, they, who is uh, in anything, <laughs> nothing more, even his name seems to suggest that he's nothing more than a title, doesn't even have a person who has yeah. a name. It is the glorious one. The Saint Glorious One needs some type of body. And so they're creating the body around him, borrowing it from other saints, putting him into their stories, giving him even the prayer, the prayer uh, significance. It all fits to a pace, it all fits to a pattern. Now, to be fair, uh, we're not saying that this is categorical. This is how it happens. These are, obviously. again, these are speculations. Yeah. Uh, you've, I think what you've done here, though, you, you are there at number four. Uh, you probably are at the fourth degree because you're putting in, you're, you're making it, you're substantiating it, you're supporting it. You're, you're actually saying that these do fit the narrative that we now see in Islam. Uh, these are, are all, uh, the, the, what they have borrowed are all prior to this because we're going back to the fourth century then brought it and incorporated into the 10th century and later. Remember, because all this theological import of what we now know about what's happened in the cave, the stories themselves only begin to appear in the 9th and 10th century. They don't appear earlier than that. We, this is something we have to keep reminding our audience. None of these stories about Muhammad come from his time period. None of them come from the 7th century. None of them come from his lips. None of them come from anybody who lived at that time. None of them come from any of his companions. They all come from Al-Buhari, that's 870, Sahih Muslim, that's 875, Ibn Tirmidhi, they all come from Al-Tabari, that's 923, Baidawi, Zamakshari, Suyuti, and those who come after. They're all much, 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 much too late, 9th to 10th. 9th to 10th century, that's two to 300 years after the fact. So it makes sense then that as they're now incorporating these stories, borrowing them, they're now putting new meaning into those forms. Well done, this is great fun. This is what I love to do and this is why it's so good having people like you, Mel, come along, who then help us to unpack it, to show it. Now that means for those of you who are watching, start putting your, your, your uh, feedback. Let's get your feedback. Mel will be looking at it. He will try to be responding to it. If we see some real good questions down there that we need to then uh, try to respond to, we will do that. We'll make another one a follow-up. God bless you, Mel. It's been great to have you. Now, I was thinking this would only be about four or five minutes. It's gone about quite a bit more <laughs> because as you were even introducing it, you were coming up with new ideas and that's great. That means you are thinking, you are uh, tabulating and you're also coming back and responding and assimilating. And then of course, uh, making sure that the others then hear it so that they can respond in kind. God bless you. It's been trick for having you. Yeah. This is Jay and Mel over and out. Thank you.